Now, we've talked about some pretty heavy issues and some, you know, high up issues and the, and the big boy court, as we like to call it. But the day to day practice of being a criminal defense lawyer doesn't involve often such lofty issues. But they're very important to the person that's involved. And so I'd kind of like to, to shift focus a little bit and let's talk about many, many people on a daily basis and more people. Um, get arrested for misdemeanors and felonies, but you see time and time again somebody get charged with a misdemeanor and attempt to represent themselves or perhaps not spend as much money as maybe they think they should because it's only a misdemeanor. And we have found that that's somewhat uh, penny wise and a pound foolish. And Brian, can you explain to me, why do you think somebody should hire an attorney if they've been charged with a misdemeanor? Well, a misdemeanor might be the least serious of the crimes that set forth in our laws that can still have serious implications on you. And there's certain things that I think a lot of people just don't understand. If you pick up a misdemeanor pot charge and you go to court and say you just wanted to get rid of it, you pled and you were adjudicated guilty, you're going to eat a two-year driver's license suspension. A lot of people don't know about that. Say you went to court on a similar type charge or you just picked up a drinking in public type citation or a breach of the peace and you just got adjudicated guilty again and sometime down the road you got arrested for a felony that you didn't commit. The state dropped the felony and you wanted to have that felony sealed so nobody could see that on your record where you're not going to be eligible anymore. There's a whole host of serious consequences that can come with a misdemeanor conviction. In particularly, and something that um, is very much in the current events in the public eye with the Ray Rice matter is domestic violence. And um, there's a wealth of those misdemeanor cases, but the consequences that flow from a domestic violence conviction are tremendous. Um, everyone thinks, well, if you become a felon, you can't own a gun. That's true. But if you're convicted of a crime of domestic violence under, under federal law, you're prohibited from owning a firearm, from possessing a firearm. And God forbid you're in a career like here in Jacksonville, which we have so many military members with all the, the military bases we have in the area. If you were to be convicted of a crime of domestic violence, you can't possess a weapon. Well, good luck serving as a member of the military in this country by having that disqualification. If you need your weapon to be able to be a good soldier, a good sailor. Absolutely. And so even though it's a misdemeanor, the consequences of these, these crimes can be very serious. I also believe if you're not a U.S. citizen and you pick up a domestic violence uh, conviction that you're going to be subject to deportation. It's a crime, it would be considered a crime of violence yeah. under right. the immigration laws. And there, and, you know, it's something that could be used to support deportation. As can other misdemeanors. As can other misdemeanors. Certainly. Uh, and the other thing that we see with misdemeanors is that they can layer the cake, so to speak. Exactly. For example, the, the classic example is petty theft. You've picked up one of those, two of those, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Well, when you hit that third one, it can be charged as a felony. So it may not have been that bad the first couple go-rounds, but all of a sudden you find yourself in felony court and you might end up being a convicted felon. Likewise, not even domestic battery, but simple battery, bar fight, you know, what have you. If you have a, a prior battery conviction, and you get into another misdemeanor battery situation, they can file it as a felony battery because you had a prior. And that's the direct, immediate legal consequences. There's a host of And let me interrupt you here, too, because we haven't even talked about driving while license suspended, because that's what I think a lot of people don't realize also. You're stacking those driving while license suspended, and you rack enough of those up, and you're going to find yourself not only in felony court, but we have seen people who they're either were not adequately represented or thought they could represent themselves that have ended up in state prison for suspended license. And, and I think people don't understand that. And it's very easy to happen. Um, as we, anyone who's been to court knows, it's an expensive proposition, not just the lawyers, but at the end of the day, if there's a disposition, they impose court costs, and they're routinely several hundred dollars. And if you don't pay those, they'll suspend your license. And the vortex gets deeper yes. and much deeper and harder to dig out of. So that's one of the, the important matters of getting an attorney is somebody that's been on that battlefield before, that knows where the mines are, that can avoid setting them off and blowing your legs up, that can get you through the process in damage control. And that's just directly in the criminal setting. 
The collateral consequences that go with a lot of these crimes, domestic violence, possession of even misdemeanor marijuana, but certainly drugs, a lot of these crimes, if you go to get a job, they run a criminal history and they see this, you're immediately taking yourself out of the employment pool. Are you, you going to rent an apartment? Get an apartment. They run a background check. You have one of these convictions on your record, drugs, domestic violence, or a whole host of other things. They'll disqualify you from being a renter. So it's not just what happens in the courtroom. It's what happens months, years later outside the courtroom that people may not appreciate what they've done by representing themselves or not going with the caliber, caliber of counsel they should have had. And even issues like, I want to buy a house. People don't realize that criminal convictions affect your credit score. And I think for a lot of people, they think, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to take care of it. That's what, I'm going to take care of it. I don't want to spend X amount of dollars, but they don't realize that they are going to be spending that money over and over again in other ways. You were talking about... Uh, why you hire an attorney, but one of the other things that an attorney can do for you at the end of the case is to see if you're eligible for a sealing or expungement. And can you, we've talked about this I think before, but it's very important, many states do not have the ability to seal or expunge records, but Florida does. It's limited, you only get one shot at it, but explain for people what that is and why it's so important. As Brian said earlier, um, it's important how you handle your criminal matter. As Betsy said, in Florida, you have one bite at the apple. If you have a case and it's dismissed, they don't file charges, you're eligible for an expunction, meaning under the statute, the records are obliterated, destroyed, forever gone. Um, if you go to court and are able to secure what's known as a withhold of adjudication under Florida law, which under Florida law does not count as a conviction, uh, there are certain set settings where they treat it as such, but generally as a matter of Florida law, a withhold of adjudication does not count as a conviction. If you receive one of those, you can have your record sealed. Back before everything was digital, literally, the clerk would put a piece of tape around the file and it would be sealed. Now they do it digitally, it's sealed off. But what the, why that's important is if someone were to, to seek the public records regarding that conviction, run a background check through FDLE, go to the sheriff's office and ask if a person's ever been arrested, the answer that they will receive if you've had your record sealed or expunged is no. And you, as a person that's received that sealing or expunction, can put down on that employment application, that job application, with certain exceptions. Um, you can deny the fact of an arrest. Um, and so it's valuable to have that criminal case handled well so that at the end of the day you'd have the benefit of receiving that so that it protects you from these collateral things later. Rent, you know, lease applications, employment applications, college applications. To be able to de deny the fact of an arrest and not have that in the public domain is very important. But you need to have the criminal case handled appropriately because as Brian said, if I picked up a, a, a ordinance violation for spitting on the sidewalk that was treated as a misdemeanor and I pled it out at first appearance because I wanted to get out of jail and the judge adjudicated me guilty for spitting on the sidewalk and later on God forbid the person was to pick up a... a somebody falsely accused you of rape, for instance. Somebody made a false accusation of a very, very serious offense, and, and the charges are dismissed. You are stuck with that. Okay. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize that, that these very minor charges can have very serious consequences later on because it limits your ability, if you are wrongfully charged with a crime, to get that wrongfully charged crime off your record. Yeah. And any, that's why it's so significant. Any conviction, not just for the crime that you're trying to have sealed, but anything that you've ever been convicted for prevents you from getting a record sealing yes. or expunction. It's a disqualifier. And, that, and that's why no matter how big or small the crime might be, and even if it is an ordinance violation like Matt said, you need to have a well-trained lawyer to handle the charges for you. And, and talking about well-trained lawyers, because anyone that sees our site and knows anything about us or researches us knows that in addition to be, being criminal defense lawyers, we're also civil rights lawyers. And uh, Bill Shepard truly was the first civil rights lawyer in the, in the city of Jacksonville. There, there 
there really was not, uh, well, with the exception of Sam Jacobson, I would say he, Judge Sam, and Judge Manus, it was it was a a, uh, a very uh, select club, mainly because no one else wanted to do it. Uh, you had to have a real desire to be a civil rights attorney in the late 60s and the early 70s. You didn't get uh, there, you weren't paid for it. There was no ability to recover your fees and you did it for love. Um, <clears throat> to a certain extent, you still do it for love, but you try to get paid at some level. But Brian, I think a lot of people view, I, I have a civil rights case, My uh, the police wrongfully arrested me, why can't I sue them, or why can't, why why isn't a, a, a police officer beating me like a car wreck? I don't think a lot of people understand the importance of hiring an experienced civil rights lawyer to handle their case. So talk to us a little bit about why isn't a civil rights case just like a, a car wreck case? What makes it different? Well, if we go with your police example, um, there's several immunities that the police have built up that go way back to our time over in England before we ever came over here. That just aren't as simple as somebody hit me and they did something wrong. Um, and oftentimes these cases end up in federal court, which requires a lot of research and writing, which I think the majority of people that just do car crash cases aren't really comfortable with doing. And these cases take a long time and we're experienced in them. And that's why we'd like to uh, help you out on that. And there's, with particularly with the civil rights cases, police misconduct in particular, the body of law that's developed in that area is so specific to that area that unless you practice with it with some regularity, you can get lost in the body of law regarding qualified immunity. Yes. When is an officer or a government agent entitled to qualified immunity? Unless you sift through that on a regular basis, you could literally get lost in the law books trying to research that. Yes, and another point, Matt, that I think a lot of people don't realize, we've been talking about qualified immunity. Well, what does that mean? It's a term of art. It's a legal term that the courts have developed by common law to say, even if a police officer did wrong, we are not going to hold that police officer responsible. Part of the pro part of the challenge of litigating a qualified immunity case is they get an automatic appeal. If they file a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment on qualified immunity and that motion is denied, they have the right, the absolute right, to take an appeal. So in, in addition to being able to draft paper and be a good trial lawyer at the trial level, you by definition must be an appellate lawyer if you're going to do civil rights litigation because Brian in the last let's say, let's say the last 10 civil rights cases you litigated what percentage of them were appealed before they were uh, before you got to the the end of the case oh at least half at, at least, least half, half. And, and the way to look at it like this is Betsy was talking about or Matt was talking about bites at the apple with the expungements the defendants in these cases really get three bites at the apple. They'll file a motion to dismiss to try to throw your case out. If they don't get it there, they'll file another motion. If they don't win on those, they'll take an appeal to try to get your case thrown out. And then if they lose that, then you still got trial. So they're going to have a lot of chances to get your case thrown out. And guess what? You prevail at trial, they get another appeal. Four bites. Yeah, yes. you're right. So yes. um, it's a very technical and highly specialized area of the law. And as Brian noted, if you're if you're going to litigate a civil rights case, you can do it in state court. But just as that body of law is uh, highly specialized, the state court judges don't see a whole lot of it. And it is our practice that if we're going to bring those cases, bring them into federal court where the judiciary is familiar with that body of law, and you can get to the issues with people that understand the area. Yes, it's not a car wreck. And I think I hear time and time again when people call us, they they uh, there's a wrong, and what is the remedy and the difficulty in civil rights litigation is that if you do not have an attorney that is very experienced both in the courtroom and can get the law together for a judge to understand it you're not going to be able to convince the court that you have a case and you're going to get thrown out of court and you're going to receive nothing at all. Well I also think too that when you're litigating against these governmental entities and the people defending the government they don't view it like an insurance company whether it's defending a car wreck. They Correct. Don't, I don't think the cost benefit analysis is the same they'll tend to fight these more yes you know, tooth and nail just to prove a point so to speak yes and and they most often there there are private firms but in many instances you are you are litigating against a public attorney and they are 
not only are they competent, but they're going to get a paycheck no matter what. So, whereas another attorney would say it's not cost effective for me to take an appeal, you know, a, a government attorney doesn't have to do that because it's not their money. So, if they think I'm going to take this appeal, there's not the financial consideration that a private attorney would have that this appeal is going to cost me a certain amount of money. They, they do that in good faith, and I'm not implying in any way that it's not done in good faith, but when you do not have that financial hurdle, so to speak, uh, this is going to cost me X, and you can go ahead and do it and you're going to get paid, what is the benefit for not doing it? Why would you not do it? So these cases are appealed. They are, they are fiercely litigated by competent attorneys who handle these kind of cases all the time because just like we're not car wreck attorneys, the defendant's lawyers are not car wreck attorneys either and they're very experienced in the law. So you have some, some, uh, some worthy adversaries and every battle is going to be hard fought.